everyone. Welcome to my presentation at the Aerospike User Summit of 2021. My name is Tim Fawkes and I run the Solutions Architecture Group at Aerospike. Today I'm going to be talking about the Java Object Mapper. So the Java Object Mapper is near and dear to my heart. Before I joined Aerospike, I spent many, many years as an enterprise application architect in um, Java. So designing very large enterprise class systems. Aerospike is an incredibly powerful NoSQL database, able to do millions of transactions per second, able to um, scale up to petabytes in size whilst keeping latency very, very fast. Um, so we typically get 99 to 95% transactions sub millisecond. But to me, there seemed to be a disconnect. In Aerospike, it's easy to create an Aerospike client. You can see some examples on the screen here. I create a new Aerospike client. I then create a key. Um, and the key is designed to hold a record. Now we call it a key value database, but really our value is more like a record in relational terms. The record is divided up into columns, what we call bins. So you can see a very simple example on the screen. I create my key, I then go and on my client, I go and put the information into bins. When I want to go and read the information, I can simply go and call the client, get the information back, uh, passing the key, and then I can extract the parts of that object that I want and put them into my Java applications. That works really well in simple programs. And we'll often see that the examples we see on websites are of these very simple programs. But what happens as we get into a more complex scenario? So as a Java architect for a long time, I looked at this and realized that we need a better way of mapping. So if we look at this, I've got a moderately complex object. It's a customer. In this case, we've got a customer which has a customer ID, a first name, a last name, date of birth, a phone number, the date they joined the bank, um, whether they're a VIP customer, and a salutation. So a total of eight fields. When I want to map that object onto Aerospike, it takes me a good number of lines of code. I have to go and create the key. But then for each one of those attributes that I want to get out of that object in Java, I have to create a new bin and I have to extract that information. When I want to go and read the information back, I have to get my record, the way we saw on the previous slide, but then I need to take each part of the record and map it back onto the Java Pojo or plain old Java object. This is a fairly simple example. There's only eight fields here, but you can see there's a good number of field, good number of lines of code. And I have, I've done this the very simple way. I haven't done the common things you do in an enterprise class situation, like mapping the constant names of ID and first name and last name into actual constants. There's also some complexities here. If you look at the date of birth bin and the joined bank bin, they're both a date in Java. So a Java util date, I want to map that to Aerospike. Aerospike doesn't have an inbuilt date type. So we have to take the object, extract it as a long, map that long onto the database. But we have to be careful to make sure that we're not mapping null in the wrong way. So that if the object is null, I can't just call get time to get its time representation in milliseconds. So there's complexities. I can't easily map things like dates or instance. Mapping an array is difficult. Aerospike stores information in a very high precision. So if I'm storing a number, an integral number into the uh, Aerospike, it's going to be stored natively as a long. But when I get it back, I might want it as an integer. I might want it as something which I, in some situations, I have to downcast explicitly. I have to remember that it's going to be stored with a higher precision and then I need to cast it down. Experienced Java programmers uh, who've used Aerospike for a while will look at this code and say, but you haven't passed any policies. The first parameter to every operation in the Aerospike client is a policy. And this can determine important things like retry operations. How often do we want to retry? How long do we want to pause before retries? And unfortunately, it's a bit of a pain to keep specifying this. So what I've seen in practice is that people tend to initially put null in. Aerospike will then use the defaults for the appropriate policy and then come back and do it as an afterthought. 
These are really important things. Policies will dictate how your application responds in the face of failures. And doing it as an afterthought is not a good idea. It's also, this is an eight field object that we're mapping across. It hasn't considered relationships to other objects, anything like that. So the maintainability of this code is low, and this is only eight fields. As we get bigger and bigger and trying to map more and more complex objects into Aerospike, this code gets more and more complex. In fact, when I was hand coding this as an example, I made a mistake. One of these was a copy and paste error. Um, and so this code didn't actually pass my unit test because it, I, I put a copy and paste error in. And this was just a simple like, a field class. So we designed the Java object mapper. The Java object mapper is designed to map POJOs onto Aerospike and back. It's very lightweight. It doesn't rely on you having other frameworks. So if you're not using the Spring framework, um, it doesn't matter. We have another talk at Summit on how to use Spring data with Aerospike. And that works really well if you're using Spring. But if you want something that's lightweight and sits on top of the Aerospike client, then the Java object mapper is a good alternative. The advantage is your code still has access to the underlying client. If you want to do something that the Java object mapper doesn't do, then you can still use the Aerospike client in the way you normally would. So you can see in the code sample we've got here, we have an Aerospike client. Uh, we instantiate it as per normal. We then take that client and we pass it into a builder, an error mapper builder. And in this case, we're not going to do anything complex with it. We're just going to call build. Once we've built it, I'm going to get a customer. So I'm going to call create and populate, which is just going to fill in some fields in that customer. The same customer I showed on the previous slide. And then instead of trying to get all the bins and information mapped across, I'm just going to say to the mapper, save. And that will go and take that object and put it into the database in the format you can see down the bottom there. Um, when I want to read it back, all I have to do is call read. And that will take the information from the Aerospike record and put it back into the Java POJO. And this information is identical to the one that I hand coded once I fixed that mistake that I made. So the records in Aerospike are identical. It's just the process of taking that Java object and mapping it onto Aerospike and mapping it back that differs. Now, in order to do that mapping successfully, we have to pass some information into the Java object mapper. The first thing we need to do is put some annotations in to tell it how to map this information onto Aerospike. We've got a customer. We need to tell it where to put that customer. So the first annotation I'm going to define is the Aerospike record. The Aerospike record has a few parameters, but the main ones you'll pass are the namespace and the set. Where am I going to go and store this information? There's other parameters we can set there. Do I want to always send the key to this record? Do I want to perform durable deletes when you call the delete methods? Things that you want to set up that you don't want to set, have to set up on each call are typically passed to the Aerospike record. Inside the record, we then have a few more annotations. So the first one we come across is the Aerospike key. We need to be able to provide to Aerospike what the key to this record is. The key is a three tuple. Part of it is the namespace, part of it is set, both those are defined at the record level. And the third part is the actual key that you're passing, the object or the identifier. Now in our case, we've got a customer ID. So we're going to annotate that with Aerospike key and then it, it, the Java object mapper will use that customer ID as the key of that particular record. Now, we also want that to be stored in Aerospike. So by default, with the Java object mapper, once I've annotated it with an Aerospike record, every single bin or every, sorry, every single field is going to be placed into a bin. But they're going to be put in with the field name. So customer ID is a bit long for my liking. I want to call it ID. So I've defined an Aerospike bin annotations. I've set the name to be ID. And therefore, that will be stored in Aerospike with an ID. I've done the same thing for date of birth. Um, I've also done the same thing with the preferred salutation string further down. I just want it to be called greet instead. There's a field down the bottom. I've annotated with Aerospike exclude. I don't want that bin to be stored in, sorry, I don't want that field to be stored in Aerospike. 
there's some fields that you may not want to be stored. And that's a way of saying, I'm going to store all the fields apart from the ones that you tell me not to. Now, the nice thing about this approach is the mapping from this object to Aerospike is stored on this object. I don't have multiple sets of code that I need to change if I want to add a field onto the class. If I didn't do something with the Java object mapper, typically what we see is people have mapper methods where they take the POJO and they map it to the database and one which takes the object from the, the record from the database and maps it back to the POJO. Here, all the information is stored in the same place on the class that you're doing the mapping of. You might have noticed in the previous slide that we had a couple of Java dates. Those dates will automatically get translated into a form that we can store in Aerospike. So you can see this is a set of some of the mapping that the Java object mapper will do for you. All the integer number types, be it bytes, um, and you'll see that some of those are repeated because it's either the primitive type or the object type, they'll all get mapped into the long or the numeric integral type in Aerospike. If it's a float or a double, it'll go into a double. Now, the Java object mapper has intelligence. It knows when it needs to downcast it. So if I've got a float in Java, I map it into the Aerospike, it'll be put in there as a double. When it comes back, the Java object mapper will automatically downcast it from a double to a float and put it back into your destination. Booleans will get stored as a long. Instance also gets stored as longs as well as dates. Strings, obviously, um, Aerospike natively supports strings, so we map that across. Byte arrays are also natively supported in Java, so we'll map that into a blob. If we have arrays, and we'll talk more about this, but a, an array of, you know, an int array or string array, customer array, that'll get mapped into a list. Lists can get mapped into lists or maps, and we'll cover this in more detail because it's a very powerful feature. If I have a map of something, it'll get translated into a map in Aerospike, and other object references are also fully supported. Now, they can be as references or they can be embedded. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So let's have a look at how we map references. So I've got a parent and a child. The parent has exactly one child. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You can see on the top left of this slide that I've got two class definitions. They um, both have a, an Aerospike record. They both define a namespace and a set. In the parent, I have an Aerospike key, which is an ID, and it has a reference to a child. I haven't annotated that. If I don't annotate that reference, then the Aerospike reference annotation is assumed. In my child, I've just got a few attributes. Now, I need to go and save each of those objects. So I've called map.save with a parent and map.save with a child. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see how they are represented in Aerospike. So the parent object has two parameters. One is the ID and one is the child. Now, we're, we're doing a reference. We don't want that child object embedded in the parent. So all we've stored there is the primary key. When, we set, when I set this object up, I set the primary ID to be child one. When I um, do a select from the child, you can see the, the key is again child one. If I didn't want the key stored in Aerospike, then I can explicitly exclude it as we saw with the Aerospike exclude. The Aerospike reference annotation has three parameters. The first one is the reference type. Typically, we'll use an ID as we've got in this slide, but if for some reason we want to store a digest, you can um, change the type to be digest and it will store the digest of the referenced object inside Aerospike. We set batch load to be true. We want the Java object map to be able to load multiple children with a single call for efficiency. And we'll cover that in a bit more detail later. There's one other parameter which says, do I want this to be la lazy loaded or not? The slide shows how we save, but when I read, I could do a single call to mapper.read and pass it the parent. The Java object mapper will load the entire object hierarchy by default. So in this case, it'll load the parent and it'll load the child, form them together into object hierarchies, 
um, and then pass it back as the return value. Now, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want to just load the parent and have a reference to the child if I need it. So if I pass lazy equals true, the child won't get loaded. What the Java object map will do is instantiate an instance of the child, but just set the ID. So you can go and load it whenever you want um, in your appropriate code. So that's how we refer to an object. Let's look at what happens if we want to embed an object. So this occurs if I have an object that only makes sense inside the context of its parent. So maybe an address. I'm storing a customer. A customer has addresses. I, those addresses don't mean anything to me outside the context of the customer. I don't necessarily want them stored. So you can see I've changed the object a fraction. The only thing I've changed was that default error spike reference now has become an error spike embed. And I've set the type. I've set the um, embed type to be map, and that's actually the default. If I go and save the parent, now note in this case, the child is embedded in the parent itself. So the child doesn't need to be saved. It's going to be saved when we save the parent. If I go and save that uh, parent object, if you look at the top on the right, you can see where I select from the parent, I have a map which contains the child. So just that child bin has suddenly become a map. And you can see I've got the name, uh, the age, and the key all explicitly listed. So everything that I need is put inside that map within the object. If I want to embed it as a list, then I can do so just changing the embed type from map to list. And if you look down the bottom, you can see it's now a list. The list is more compact. By default, the Java object mapper will sort the attributes it's storing and will sort it by the name. Um, so in this case, the age comes first because it's alphabetically the smallest. There's pros and cons of each. The top one where we're storing it as a map is more readable. It's easier to debug and understand what's being stored there. It's also easier if the object is going to be changed, if I'm going to add more fields to it later. If I look at the bottom one, however, it's more compact. It requires less disk space. If I want to start adding more attributes, it's more complex, but the Java object mapper has a way of handling that. Um, we're not going to cover that in this talk, but the online documentation shows how to do that. All right, so that's a single object reference. What about lists? I've got a list of objects. So my sample code down the left-hand side, I've got a container and the container is going to contain items. The items are part of a to-do list. So they contain an ID, they contain when that we're due to do this, um, do this uh, item and a description of the item. So a fairly simple thing. And you can see we started off with error spike reference. So I've annotated that list of items with an error spike reference. That's going to dictate how that child is stored. So the code on the right, I've put four items in my container. I've started off and instantiated a container. I've given it an ID and a name. And then I've gone and added four items into that list in the container. I've gone and saved the parents. Or sorry, I've instantiated my Java object mapper. Then I've gone and saved my container. Because these are references to other objects, I have to go and then save each item inside that list. So we do mapper.save on each one of the items. I can then go and have a look at the information. So down the bottom on the right, I've got a set of AQL calls. You can see that when I look at the items, they're what you'd expect. They'll have the um, item description, they'll have the ID, and they'll have the due date. When I go and look at the um, container itself, however, it now has a list of references. Because we didn't tell the Aerospike reference annotation what sort of ID to use, it's going to use the primary key. It's not going to use the digest. So you can see the primary key of the IDs, sorry, primary key of the items are now stored in a list in the items under the container. If I go and read the parent, it will automatically go through and read each one of the children, populate the list, and then assign that list onto the container um, in the items. So I can do that in a single call. Now, the previous slide was showing us what happens when we referenced different objects in the list. 
When we want to embed items in a list, it becomes a lot more powerful. So we're just going to go and change that one line we had highlighted on the previous slide. Where in the previous slide, it was an error spike reference. We're going to go and change that now, and we're going to make it an embedded item. Now, there's two different things that we need to change. One is how is the item itself stored? And then the other is what is the sort of container that we're storing that item in? So if you look on the top left, we've decided to change it so that we're going to put everything inside a list and each element, each item in that list is going to be a map. So I've got my error spike embed with the type equals list. So that's my parent container. And the elements in that are going to be a map. And then if you look at the um, items that came out of AQL down the bottom of that top left box, we've got the items being a list and each item in that list is a map. Moving across to the top right, I can change it so I embed a list inside a list. All I need to do is change the embed type to list. Then when I go and save the ob objects again, everything has changed so my items are now being stored as a list. And so that's a list within a list. If I want to change my parent type to be a map, all I need to do is change that type on that embed to map. So if you look at the bottom left, we've got a map of maps. But I've been, in, if you remember in Java, I've just got this as a list of items. What am I going to use my map key? And the answer is I'm going to use the ID of the object or the primary key of the object as the map key. So I could, if you can have a look at that bottom left, I'm using a map of maps. The primary key of the map is the ID of that record. So I've got that information um, in a map format. Now this allows me to use my map operations to do some manipulation of this. And possibly one of the more useful formats is the bottom right. Here we're storing this to use a map of lists. The primary ID is the key. So you see that I've got my four items. The ID of each one of those ones is the primary part, is the, um, sorry, the map key. And then the value in the map is a list of items. You might notice that the list of items no longer has the ID in it. It's redundant. So we've removed it. I can always get it from the map key. Now, this is a very useful format, and we see this format a lot where we have a map of items and each item represents an object and that object is stored as a list. Now, one capability that the Java object mapper that isn't shown here is sometimes I want to reorder that list. You might notice I've got the date as a second parameter in that list in that bottom right box. Maybe I want that date first so I can do a get by value range or remove by value range. The Java object mapper has ways of controlling what the order of the items in the list are. So I could move those items around and it gives you a very powerful and flexible way of mapping these objects to the database at the mere change of annotations. The other thing that's really useful to use is virtual lists. Imagine I have a collection of objects that I don't want to constantly bring all the way back to the client to manipulate and send them back. Something like credit card transactions or audience segments if I'm in ad tech. I have a list of items and I want to be able to manipulate them at the database level and just bring back the things I want. So this is where virtual lists really shine. So look at the code on the left here. I've got my container. Again, I've embedded this inside. The, this list of items is now embedded as each item being a list inside a map. I created a new container. I give an ID of one and a name of container. And I go insert my four elements again. I create my error mapper builder, and then I say save. On the top right, you can see what happens in the database there. The error mapper or the Java object mapper has saved that as a key value, key ordered map of those four items, with the key being the um, ID of that object as we saw before. Underneath that AQL trace on the top right, you can see I've put the um, operation. So this is a put, which took five milliseconds in this case. We can see the operations that the Java object mapper is using behind the scenes. In the code on the left, after I've saved that container, I then create a virtual list of items. And I'm just saying it 
it's a back list. It's the backing is the container and I'm using the field, the list field items. And each item in that list is going to be an item class. After I've done that, I can then go and append a new item. And all I have to do is just give my item and say list.append. Now, this is a virtual list. It's designed to manipulate the database. So calling that is not going to affect the items in the container that I have in my Java memory. But what it is going to do is it's going to go and do and operate on the database and insert that item into the database. So you can see the AQL trace after I've done that. I've now got my five items in the list. Um, they're there in the database, but I haven't got that fifth item in my memory for on that container I initially created. But I can also do more complex things. We're using the operate command, as you can see under that AQL trace. And operate is very, very flexible. It's one of the most underutilized features in Aerospike. It's very powerful. I want to do a set of things. In this case, I want to append a new item. I want to remove an item with a key of 200. And then I want to get any items in the range from 100 up to, but not including 450. So I begin a multi-operation. I give it those three lines that you can see on the screen at the bottom left. And it, the Java object mapper turns that into an operate command. So you can see the on the right-hand side that we've now got items 100, 300, 400, 500, and 600 in the database. It's done that operate. And then the Java debug uh, stack you can see on the bottom right, these are the objects that were returned. It returned three results because there's only the keys with um, 100, 300, and 400 that match the, the criteria. And so it brought them back. And by default, it's going to bring them back as items. So I got these in my list of results simply by saying get by key range. I didn't have to do any form of unpacking or anything like that. All right, so we've covered object references. Very, very powerful. What about polymorphism? One of the biggest um, tenets of the OO databases is their ability to have objects of different types. How do we map those to Aerospike? So I've got a very simple example here. You can see the class diagram in the top right hand corner. I've got a B, B is a superclass. It has children of C and D, and I have an A which has references to B. If you look at the code I've got, um, I've got my class A has actually three references because I want to show you different ways it, it occurs. So I've got a top B, so I'm going to give it an actual B. I'm going to give it a C, and I'm going to give it a D. But when I define class A, I'm going to define them all as being Bs because a C really is a B as well. Now, in traditional object-oriented systems, when you map into a database, the object to relational mapping has two choices. It can either put the subclasses into the superclass table and give it more columns, or each one of those subclasses can have its own table, um, and the Java object mapper supports both of them. So if we look at these definitions, I've got um, Aerospike record on class B. B just has those two um, attributes of an ID and a name but it's set up and been told that I'm going to store the information in namespace test and the set B. C extends B. It's been annotated as an Aerospike record, but I haven't defined where I want to store that information. So by default, that's going to inherit the namespace and the set from um, B. So it's also going to store its information in test, um, namespace of test and set name of B. However, D, I want it, it also extends B, but I want that to be stored in its own table. So in its Aerospike record definition, I've simply specified the namespace and the set I want it to be stored in. If you go and look at, on the right, you can see the results. The top right, I have um, select star from test.a, and it shows me the references. Now, what you might notice is that top B, I defined as a B, and I actually stored a B in it. So my B just has a reference to the primary key of the object, so the two. If you look in the next one down where I do select star from test.b, you'll see there's two different records, one of which is an ID of two, which is that top B, that's that B I created explicitly. The other one has an ID of three and the name of C, and it's actually an instance of class C. If I look in the top select star from test A again, 
you'll see that the C as a B now has not just the number or the ID of its record, but it now has a list. It's got the ID of the record, three in this case, but it also needs the class name so that it knows when I'm loading an instance of this class, where to go and get the definition. Where do I have to go and load this instance from? So the reference to an object stores either the key, if it's of the type that it was declared as, or it stores the type that it needs to load um, in order to know how to reference that object properly. You can see the same thing applies to my D. In my select star from test.a, I have again a list, the ID is four, but it's stored as D. When I did my select star from B, that record didn't appear because we defined D to use its own set. So down the bottom in the middle, you can see select star from test.d, it has that one record that I created as a D. So the Java object mapper has handled this inheritance. This is a fairly simple example, but it can do multiple nesting of objects um, in different inheritance hierarchies. So it gives you a lot of power and control over how this information is mapped to Aerospike. I can also choose to embed this information. Previously, I was using a reference, but what if I want to have the same example and change it to an embed? And the only thing I did was on that top left in my class A, I've changed them to use Aerospike embed. By default, if I don't specify how to use these references, it's going to use an Aerospike reference. So I've told it to embed my top B, my C as a B, and my D as a B. And if you look where I do my select star from test.a, you'll notice now that I have a magic dot type parameter. This is telling my map what sort of object it's really storing. That way, when I go and load that instance for my C as a B and my D as a B, they're both children. I need to know when I go and instantiate this, what it is. So I have to go and say, ah, this is really a C, I need to instantiate a C. Then I can populate the attributes, not just of the C, but also the ones that inherits from B. So you can see I've got the other name that I got from the C, which extended my B, but the name and the ID I got from my B. Um, so it knows about inheritance and how to map these objects across. When you create an object in Java, obviously you need to use a constructor. If you have given the class that you're using a no argument or a default constructor, it will use that by default. If you haven't given it one and there's exactly one constructor, it'll be used by, it will use that one constructor. If however you have multiple constructors in your class, you must annotate one of them with an Aerospike constructor. And this will tell the Java object mapper which constructor you wanted to use. So this is particularly useful if you've got final fields. You've got the fields marked as final, you want to be able to create them, but you need to have a constructor which passes the objects it needs in that constructor. But if I'm going to pass parameters to my constructor, Java loses the names of the parameters at runtime. So you need to give it this at param from the symbol, which will tell it how to map this, on this information from the bin. So let's look at our code examples. Default constructor on the left. You can see the first class I've got is an item. It's got two constructors. It's got a item which takes an int, a due date, and a description, and then a no argument constructor. I've given it the no argument constructor, so we're going to use that in the Java object mapper by default. The second class, item two, has no constructors. So even though we haven't explicitly given it one, Java will generate that default no argument constructor. Java object mapper will use that just fine. On the right hand side, here I've given it a particular constructor. This class only has one constructor and it takes parameters. So the Java object mapper knows there's one constructor, it knows it has to use it, but each particular um, parameter passed to that constructor must be annotated with the param from. This tells it when we're mapping it from the record onto that object, which part of the record should I use to get that information? Now, you can see here, this constructor takes an ID of an integer, a date, and a string. The string on the object is called description, but because description is too long, I've shortened it down to desk. The name I give that param from has to be the bin name. So in this case, the desk. You can also see that I've given this constructor a date. 
The Java object mapper knows the, param the constructor's parameter is a date. It knows it got along from the database and it works out how to convert that long into the date. So it'll give you the appropriate representation there. So the Java object mapper tries to use as much intelligence as it has about the objects that you're mapping to be able to map them properly. Now there's a myth that's in Java that all the generic information is, part, is stripped out at runtime. So a list of string and list are identical. That's close, but not entirely accurate. What, if you're using the Java object mapper, I would strongly encourage you to use generics and have a list of generics in this case. So if you look at my class on the top left, I've got two different lists there. One is a named B and one is an unnamed B. The list, the name B is a list of Bs. The unnamed B is just a list. Now we haven't given the Java object mapper any idea what is in that list of unnamed Bs. So when I go and store this, I've taken the same, I put two Bs, they're identical, um, in both the named B and the unnamed Bs. If you look at the right, when I do a select, the named B, because the Java object mapper knows that you've given it Bs, all it needs to store is just the ID. But the unnamed Bs, it doesn't know what it's a list of, so it has to remember the class information, it has to remember the type you've got there, the fact that it's a B. So we've got this magic at T parameter, which says this B, sorry, the, the type of this record, which I've got an ID of two of, is really a B. And so you can see that the use of generics and passing that information about what we actually have shortens how much information we need to store in Aerospike. And it also reduces the complexity of the amount of work we need to do loading this information. So it will speed up your program marginally. All right, so there's some of the ways of mapping information. Let's have a look at some other useful things the Java object map can do. We've seen before that when I create a Java object mapper, the easiest way is I can say, new Java object mapper.builder, pass my Aerospike client and build. But I can also pass a whole bunch of parameters to that. So I can do things like custom converters. Um, it's a bit out of the scope of this tutorial here, but effectively what it allows me to do is say, I have a class and I know better than the Java object mapper how I want that stored in Aerospike. And it gives you a way of make, mapping information that's very, very specific to your class. We can also do things like preload classes because there's a lot of introspection that's done. The first part we do is the first time we see a class, it's pretty heavy. Maybe you've got performance issues and you want to preload some of your classes up front. You can go and tell the Java object mapper to do that by giving it preloaded classes. I can also give it policies. Now I have a very flexible scheme of giving it policies. So you can see in the example, I've got um, a read policy. So I've said, I want this read policy to be read policy for all classes. But then there's a different read policy, a transaction read policy that I want to use for the children of the transaction class. Um, and I want the same write policy to be used for everything. This is set up once. Once you do that, the policies are set. I don't now need to pass the policies to the API call. It means that each class has its own class, has its own policies, it knows about them. When it comes time to map them onto Aerospike, the correct policy will just be passed. Typically what I see in um, client applications is there's only a handful of policies that are used. And so that syntax that we saw on the previous slide offers you a lot of flexibility of doing that, where you can say, I want this one policy to apply for 20 children or for all, ch or for all classes. Um, or I want this just to be specific. Now, every single API call inside the Java object mapper can take a policy. So if you do pass an explicit policy there, it is the most specific, um, we'll use that in preference. If you haven't specified a, um, a policy on a call, then we'll use the one specified for those particular classes, the most specific classes. If that's not specified, and there's any policies passed for this child um, or any children of it, then we'll use that. Otherwise, we'll use for all. And if you haven't specified any policies, then we're going to use the um, Aerospike client default policies. So the default read, the, sorry, the read policy default, the write policy default, and so on. 
One concern people often have about this is it has to use introspection. Now, there's a lot of runtime information that it get, gleans from these annotations and it works out how to do it using introspection. And people are worried about the speed of introspection. Now, yes, it's doing a bunch of work. The part it does up front is a one-time cost and we try and do as much work up front. So you can see we go and read a lot of information about the class. We'll read all the annotations, we'll work out what constructors you've got, which ones are necessary, um, if, it, if that constructor needs parameters, how do I map the information from the record onto those parameters? What policy should I use? The namespace, the set. Um, how do I get the key of the object? And for each property, uh, how do I actually get the information? Um, what's the field name do I need to use? Um, it can actually be not just fields, it can actually be getters or setters. Um, so I can annotate, I can get information from getters and setters without actually having that mapped to a field. But I determine all that information up front, it gets stored um, against that class. And then at runtime, when I'm actually going and doing these in loops and the performance critical parts of these, the amount of work done per read and per write is actually fairly minimal. So that's very, very useful. It gives us the speed that we can get with that flexibility. So yes, there's a cost, but it's not huge. In order to test this out, I thought I'd make a complex graph, something that's fairly realistic. So on the right, we have an object model. You can see there's a whole bunch of classes. I have a customer, um, so this is sort of a banking example. A customer has addresses. Um, the customer also has one to many accounts. The accounts can have checkbooks, checkbooks can have branches, the branches can have addresses and so on. Accounts can have multiple different types. Um, I've defined four types, a checking account, a savings account, both of which are just instances of an account. They can also have a loan account and a portfolio account, which are subclasses. The loan account and the portfolio account can have associated properties. So it's a very, very complex um, object model. I then went and created a realistic picture of this. I had an object graph, which has 39 different objects in it. Now, I decided some of these should roll up. So the addresses, I always wanted to be rolled up. So every address is gray, but that means that it's going to be rolled up. I also decided that the valuation should be part of the property. So they're rolled up into the valuation, sorry, into the property. And you can see from the object model, the valuation also includes addresses. So anything in gray has been rolled up. Anything in white is going to be stored in the database as its own record. So I went and loaded this. Now, the time, each of the objects got saved separately and then I rolled them up. Um, I, I did one core to go and load me my customer. And that customer um, had 39 different objects, if you remember. That load took about 1.3 milliseconds. That's on my laptop using an in-memory namespace. Don't use that as a benchmark. Um, and that wasn't the first time I loaded that. I loaded that in a loop doing 100 of them because Java takes time to warm up. But let's have a look at what happened there. So I'm actually going to use the debug Aerospy client. Um, this is an open source repository we've got in Aerospy examples. And it allows me to monitor things that happen um, inside the client. So I can show it what calls have occurred if I monitor every call like I'm doing here. So you can see in my case, I pass this um, Aerospike, the, sorry, this debug Aerospike client to my mapper. And when I get, went and retrieved that, I did a get call, that's my customer. I then did a batch call of the four keys that were in white that the customer knew about. It then did another batch call of the six dependent white children, and then another batch call of those two dependent children. So it loaded a lot of that information in parallel, even though they're different classes. Some of them were accounts, some of them were properties, some of them were um, different parts of that object model. So the Java object mapper can do all of this in parallel. And it gives you a lot of parallelization across your objects. And you can see the sort of objects we had here. This was quite a complex one. So this is one of my properties and you can see in my valuations, I had my valuations as a list and inside some of these, I had my address. My address came in as a um, list inside that map of the valuation, inside the list on the valuations. So it's a complex object being stored near a spike. 
Sometimes we don't have the luxury of changing the source code to be able to put annotations against things. So the Java object map can also take a configuration string or a configuration file, which is YAML based. You can specify all the attributes that you annotate inside this configuration file. So this is really useful if you don't want to be able to, sorry, if you don't have the ability to change your source code, um, so you've got a jar file coming from somewhere else, but you want to put those objects into Aerospike, um, or you're changing some of the definitions in different environments. So I might have a different namespace in test to what I've got in dev to what I've got in production. And the Java object mapper can use all that, just specifying that configuration file when you build it. It can take multiple configuration files. And if you do that, the first definition of a class it sees, it will use that one. If, however, you've got the class with annotations and the object in the configuration file, the configuration file will win over the annotations. Otherwise, the, it wouldn't be much use when I had to change things in different environments. So the Java object mapper is very powerful. It runs very close to the Aerospike client, but it's lightweight. It sits on top of it. Um, there's lots and lots of objects and, sorry, lots and lots of options for how to map your objects onto Java. And it's an open source library. Um, you know, feel free to contribute, feel free to um, give comments or recommendations or raise any issues if you find anything. Thank you for listening um, and please stay on for a Q&A session. Thank you, I appreciate your time today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is George Chaba from Aerospike. Uh, Tim, thanks very much for the great presentation. We would like to encourage everybody to actually um, paste their questions into the uh, chat section, and we will uh, actually reply to them in, in the order we receive them. I already actually see uh, one question. I hope everybody can see it. And um, again, please add more as, as we go. Tim, can you see the question? Yeah, uh, yes, yes, sorry. So um, the question from Adam was, um, considering the use of the Java C parameters flag um, to remove the need for the um, at from annotation or param from annotations on the constructor. That's a really good idea. We, we did consider it briefly. Um, we will probably end up supporting it, but we felt that the majority of people didn't want to mess with um, Java C flags um, during compile. So, it is something that um, we'll definitely look at as a potential enhancement request, but we'll definitely support, uh, support both. Um, I know that some of the more advanced users um, are fine playing with that Java C flag, um, but not everyone is necessarily. Um, thank you, Tim. I see another question. Um, what sort of use cases would this be useful for? Okay, so typically, when I sort of talk to customers about Aerospike, um, I, see, I see a lot of use cases. And sometimes the data models are really simple. They're storing a handful of fields. Um, so you know, the, if it's ad tech, they might have a um, user, a user might be a map and it might be, um, a, the map can, might contain segment IDs and timestamps. Um, you could certainly use the Java object mapper for this, but for something that's very simple and you're not spending a lot of boilerplate code trying to get your application working, then it's probably um, slightly overkill. There's um, one customer that I've heard of who's looking at the Java object mapper where they have objects that are very complex, like 300 fields per rec um, record. And that sort of complexity, will, this will reduce the boilerplate code dramatically. So you end up with a much smaller application and it's much more maintainable because the code used to map to the database is in the, your code already, rather than having to have different mapper files, different um, constants and things like that. Your class defines how you get things mapped to the database. So um, I, I see a fair amount of that more in financial services. Um, I see another question about the impact on my applications. Um, if you've got an existing application, then your existing application can keep running the same way. This is not trying to replace your use of the Aerospike client. Um, what this is used for is augmenting your applications. If I had something that was big and complex and messy and I had the time and energy to rewrite it, um, I would probably move it over to the Java object mapper if it had a good number of fields. It increases maintainability. You've got some technical debt there. Um, if you're 
mapping directly to bins. There's a lot of um, dead code effectively that just does boilerplate information mapping. Um, and I, I'd look at moving that across if I needed to, but certainly new use cases which were complex, I would start looking at using this um, and having it as an augmentation to your existing code. The performance impact should be very low. So as I mentioned in the presentation, the benchmarks I did, yes, there is some um, introspection. Yes, that adds some overhead, but it's pretty trivial. And the fact that we do things like batch loading of dependent objects, whereas if you were hand coded it, there might be different types and it'll be a bit of pain to that hand coding and batch loading yourself. Um, you might take some shortcuts and try and do it the longer way, which might slow you down. So in terms of performance, I expect it to be moderately um, neutral. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh there is another question just came in. Okay. Um, so does the file-based configuration get merged with the annotation-based config or does it need to totally replace it? Uh, great question, actually, and I'm sorry I didn't cover this in the presentation. The aim of the config file is twofold. Um, one is I've got objects that I can't change. Um, they came in from a jar file. I don't have the source code. I want to annotate them. The other is I want to overwrite part of the annotations. So in my test environment, I might have, um, or my dev environment, I might have set my annotations up to go to a particular namespace. But when I'm going to a higher environment, a test or a prod or a staging environment, I want to override which namespace that gets stored in. So yes, they're designed so that you can have multiple. You can have multiple different config files and you can have annotations. The, if it's specified in the config file, it will override the annotations. Um, and if you have multiple different config files, um, which reference different objects, then they'll just merge together. If multiple different config files reference or change parameters in the same object, um, then the first one, the Java object mapper sees will win. So the first config file. But yes, um, that's a great question. Uh, thank you, Tim. There's another question came in. Uh, perfect. Um, all right, so is this library available on Maven? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it's been pushed up. The current version is, I think it's 1.1. Um, and so you can download this um, from Maven Central. When um, I made the slides, it wasn't on Maven Central, so I didn't put the definitions in, but you can find it um, fairly easily on Maven Central. Uh, thank you, Tim. I don't see any more questions. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, put them in the chat. I'll just wait a couple of seconds and see if anything comes up. Uh, it looks to me there are no more questions. So I would like to thank everybody uh, for uh, joining us uh, in this session. And please enjoy the rest of the summit. And actually, there's another interesting uh, session which is coming up after this, is, which is the May the 4th Be With You uh, session, which you can join. So I hope to see you there. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate you attending the talk. Hope it was useful. Thank you.